So we're in Philippians. We're at chapter 2, verse 12. We're moving along through the book. And the, the book is about joy and rejoicing. Even though there's some difficulties going on in, in the Philippian church. And in the Philippian church, there's, there's problems, as in any church or any uh, time you're doing the Lord's work. And one of the problems they have is selfishness. Selfishness. Self-seeking. People doing their own thing. Uh, and in doing their own things, they're causing division and they're causing problems in the body of Christ. And Paul has to address that and talk to them about their selfishness. Now, I, I know we can't comprehend that because none of us are selfish. But uh, selfishness is a problem, a huge problem, not only in the church, but in the world. Uh, we, you know, if it wasn't for selfishness, we probably wouldn't have any wars or famine. We probably wouldn't have a lot of things if it wasn't for selfishness, and we probably would have a lot of things if it wasn't for selfishness. Seeking your own, looking out for number one, uh, doing things your way, and, and doing things your way, it, it might sound good and logical according to the world's uh, philosophy, but doing things God's way is really the best way only because he's the one that created me. So if he's my creator, then I'm assuming that he knows what's best for the creation. Um, it's like I had a Toyota Tundra pickup truck. And so I decided something went wrong with it. So I decided to take it to a mechanic and they didn't resolve the problem. So what did I do? I had to take it to the Dodge, the, had to take it to the Toyota dealer. Why? Because they're the manufacturer. And they fixed it. And actually, it was a simple problem. Well, I had the same issue with my, my uh, Dodge pickup truck. I got rid of the, the Toyota and got a Dodge, and it, it was not functioning. I had a malfunction. And I couldn't figure out the malfunction. You take it to a mechanic, and they run tests, and they give you a bill, and you still got a problem. And the problem was my power steering would just go out, and it would be manual. And I'm like, rrr, rrr. And, and I'm really worried about this because I'm going out west in Colorado to do the mining trails. And they're like 1,000-foot drop-offs. And I, I don't want my power steering to go out. So I go to the Dodge dealer, and it turned out that the ground wire was loose on my power steering, which is electrical and run by a computer, which is scary also. Uh, and so it was a no-brainer. Why? Because the manufacturer knew the problem with my power steering. So God is the manufacturer of my life. He built me, molded me, shaped me, designed me, uh, when, when, when you're conceived, your DNA chain is already mapped out. You're already mapped out. How tall you'll be, what color your hair will be, what color your eyes will be. Everything's mapped out. Your whole system, inside out, your, your skin, everything is completely mapped out. The whole DNA mapped out before you even come out of the mom's, mommy's belly. And what happens is, as you're in your mommy's belly, God begins to fashion you. Every little cell, every little piece of you is being fashioned together. And what it's being fashioned to is the DNA that is the strand that's in you. It's a blueprint for who you are. And that blueprint is carefully being constructed from the moment you're conceived. And it's being built and put together and engineered and when you look at, um, you know, microbiology, you're blown away, really, by what's happening inside of you. It's incredible. There's machinery at work inside of you constantly, all the time. All these cells being rebuilt all the time. Old cells being died off, new ones being built. It's incredible. So if I've got a 
situation or if I gotta, I'm going to live this life, I probably should do it God's way because he is the creator. He made me. So I, it would be best to do it. So what, how do I know what is his way? How do, I, how do I get a clue as to how, what is God's way? Well, uh, what I need to do is go into the forest, kindle a fire, put some rocks all around me, get some beads out, hold them up in the air, and say, hum. and I'll walk out of the, fire, the forest, and I'll know exactly what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to act and live and work. And if you're buying that, you're probably one of those weirdos. Um, because really, in the word of God is everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything is in that Bible. Everything. It's how to handle finances, how to handle a fellowship, how to raise a family, how to be married, Everything is in that Bible as far as you how to run, how do you operate in society, how do you deal with unsaved people, how do you deal with mean people, how do you deal with nice people? It's all in there. How do you live under your government? There, every aspect of life is in the Word of God, every bit of it. So if I want to live God's way, I have to be familiar with the owner's manual. Does that make sense? I have to be familiar with the owner's manual. And so, it's a beautiful thing to have something that you can hold on to for direction and strength. Direction and strength. Especially in turbulent times. Uh, some of you might not realize this, but we're living in turbulent times. We are. I mean, it's chaos out there. We have wars and wars and, and famine. We have disease. We have uh, society is falling apart. There is no uh, basic moral compass anymore. Uh, it's like anybody does what anybody wants to do. It's, it's, it's a mess. So what do we, we need to have some kind of moral compass. We need to have some kind of structure as to how to navigate through this life. For me, the owner's manual works. When in doubt, follow the instructions. Now, most of you guys don't know that. Uh, that's why your wives always say, did you read the instructions? Uh, we just look at the pictures. But really, it's important to read the instructions. Um, do I have a new guitar chord yet? This looks like the same one to me. Oh, thank you, brother. Yeah, I'll take any one that works. All right, I'll leave this to the professionals. Um, <laughs> drummers know all about wires. So let's get into this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Backing up. Therefore, my beloved, Paul is writing to the Philippians whom he loves, his dearly beloved. As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but also much more in my absence. He's saying, hey, I'm hearing good things about you guys. I hear that you're really, you're pressing on. You're keeping the course going. You're, you're running the race. I'm proud of you guys. However, you need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I like these Christians that like to live out your, found it, your salvation. You know, the, the, I call them Christian Gestapos. They're always telling you how to live. And you would like to just tell them how they should live, but you're, you're, you're trying to be a Christian about it. Like, okay, yes, thank you very much, and I appreciate that. And you'd like to say to them, why don't you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Stop working out my salvation. 
And I think it's important that you work out your salvation before you even attempt to try to work out somebody else's. For me, it's hard enough to just walk this Christian life out, you know, just me, let alone trying to run somebody else's life. Uh, so he's trying to tell them, hey, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, with a reverence, with, with a, a trembling of knowing that, you know, th this salvation thing is real. It's, it is so absolute wow that there should be some kind of respect involved here. Christ died for my sin. He was brutally beaten beyond recognition and hung on a cross to die for me. That should bring some kind of like, wow, Lord. Wow, Lord. Wow. I just want to bless you, Lord. I know we fall short. I know we do. But there should be something that causes us to get up and run again when we fall short. To work out our own salvation. You know, it's funny how God works in us so that we can work it out. He works it in, we work it out. What is he working in? He's working in the Holy Spirit. He's working in the anointing. He's working in the Bible. He's putting his word in you. He's putting his knowledge in you. He's giving you revelation. And he's saying that now that I put it, worked it in you, now you work it out of you. And what are we working out? What's in us? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the process of working out our salvation is sanctification. What is sanctification? It's the process that we live on earth that causes us to be more like Christ as the days go on. If you're a Christian, you should be able to look back four years ago 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or even 50 years ago, and think to yourself, you know what? I've really come a long way. You know, something inside of you should be able to recognize what a bozo you were back then. Something inside of you should say, hey, <laughs> wow. How did I get here? He was working in you as you were working it out. So work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. For it is God who works in you, both to will and do as he pleases for his good pleasure. So this morning, I get a text at 7 o'clock this morning, and the text says, sorry, Keith, but I'm not feeling well. I didn't get much sleep. Could you do the music? It's 7 o'clock. You're talking just two hours from now. No problem, brother. I'll take care of it. Hope you feel well. We're praying for you. See, it's God who wills to do and he, as he pleases for his good pleasure. Do you think that God was not aware or was clueless as to how this day would turn out for me? No. God is working in me and I'm trying to work it out of me. So what do I do? I show up. I, I text the band. I say, listen, guys. Uh, I text the Tuesday night band. I say, listen, Tuesday night, you're on Sunday. And they show up, and I show up, and my guitar doesn't work. It is God who wills to do me as he pleases for his good pleasure. So how do you keep it together? How do you keep that perspective when things aren't going your way? when things aren't going your way. You might be here today and things aren't going your way. There might be something you've been dealing with this week or something you've been dealing with this month or maybe this year. And it just isn't going your way. Or maybe it's a relationship you're in and it's just not going your way. It's God who wills to do in you as he pleases for his good pleasure and he's working in you to work something out of you. I believe that every trial you go through is molding and shaping you. If it's approached from God's perspective. See, some people go through trials and it just makes them angry and bitter and nasty. But 
A Christian should go through a trial where God is working in you. And so as you're working it out, it should be building godly character. It should be building within you faith, and it should be building in you hope if it's handled in an approach where, God, you're doing this, and I have to trust you because you love me, because you're all-knowing, and because I know that you preordained my steps before there were any of them. And with that perspective, you're going to make it through the situation. I know with this many people sitting in a room, there's people in here today, right now, that are going through stuff. And, and, and you're hearing me say this, and you're thinking, well, you know what? I hear what you're saying, but I'd really rather not be going through the trial, to be honest. Well, I'd rather not be going through the trials either. And none of us want to go through the trials. But if it's handled properly and it's approached properly, it's building in you a far greater, greater reward than you comp could ever comprehend living on this earth today. And then he says in verse 14 something really incredible. Now, it's God who wills to do in you as he pleases for his good pleasure. It's not that God's getting joy out of tormenting you. He's getting joy out of the result that it'll bring in your life, the maturity that it'll bring, the strength that it'll bring. You've heard the phrase, if it doesn't kill you, it make you stronger. Well, with the Christian, that's true. Then he says in verse 14, do all things without what? Complaining or what? Disputing or grumbling. Um, everybody close your eyes and nobody peek. Not one person peek. I want everyone to respect everyone's privacy right now. Raise your hand and put it back down if you're a grumbler. Put it back down. Raise your hand and put it back down if you're a complainer. Okay. Now, all of you who put your hand up, you're probably going to go to hell. And... Um, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I saw your, your face just drop like <laughs> Just kidding. God can even save grumblers. But grumbling and complaining, it, it, it's, it's the ability to have the improper perspective at the God-given moment. How's that sound? The improper perspective at the God-given moment. We all have those moments. We do. Just push our button, and you'll see. Push the button. It's kind of like that little gumball machines. You put the quarter in, just push the button, and out comes the gumball. And that's how we all are. We all have that mechanism, and out comes what's still left in there. God uses the trials to, to help you see what still needs to be worked on. He allows you to see the imperfections of your character. Grace. Have you ever heard that word grace? Now, grace is the power and the desire to do God's will. That's what grace is. Grace is the power and the desire to do God's will. That's grace. That's grace how it functions. It's unmerited favor, uh, but it is the power and the desire to do God's will. Now, one of the definitions of grace, which I love, is... To squeeze. Isn't that cool? One of the definitions is to squeeze. And the first time I heard that, you know what I thought of? A tube of toothpaste. Now, if you took the label off a of toothpaste and you took the label off of prop preparation H, and if you took the label off of, you know, cortisone, and you took the label off of all these tubes, right? 100% uh, silicone. And the tubes were just sitting in your bathroom. How would you be able to tell what was in the tube? Squeeze. Just squeeze. Not cool. One of the definitions of grace is to squeeze. God uses his grace for you to see what's still in there. 
And sometimes, preparation age. It's time to get things straightened out. I want to back up to 14. Do all things without grumble, complaining or grumbling or disputing. Uh, anybody know people that just love to debate? They just love it. You, you probably have a friend or a brother or a sister or somebody in your life, and they just love to debate. I, I know by your smiles that you definitely know someone like that. And you're thinking... Oh, yeah, I know someone like that. You know, if you say, hey, it's a beautiful day out there, they go, well, I don't know. Disputing. But it says do. How many things are we to do without complaining? How many things? All. How many of you know what the word all means in the Greek? It means all. Do all things without. Complaining. Wow. Wow. That's a lot, of, a lot of stuff, isn't it? In your life. In your life. That's a lot of stuff. Um, all things. Does that mean that politics is exempt? No. It's not. Is your pastor exempt? No. No complaining. Or I'll lose my job. No complaining. Do all things without complaining or disputing. Verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. No complaining, no grumbling, because the world is watching you. Hello? The world is watching you. The world's watching you. I wish my kids would get saved. Yeah? What do they see? And what do they hear? The world is watching you. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God. So our, blame, our complaining and disputing and all that negative stuff that totally goes against the whole grain of believing that God is in control and it's God who wills to do in us as he pleases for his good pleasure. When we complain and dispute, it shows a dying world who's searching for hope and they see your behavior and think, well, that ain't real. Well, that ain't what I want. I want... I want that, that peace and that joy that, that people talk about as Christians. But I don't see it in them. I, uh, it really uh, is difficult, very difficult, when you hear a parent complaining that their kids don't obey them, their kids have anger problems, and their kids are always doing this, and their kids are always doing that, and I, I don't understand it. Well, what do they see in you? Well, they just get me so upset. Yeah, exactly. What do they see in you? What do they see in you? <sighs> All right, close your eyes and raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you use, don't answer this and don't raise your hand because we'll probably not let you back in church. Um, How many of you Use curse words in front of your kids. Don't raise your hand. Because I don't want to think you're going to hell. Um, how many of you use curse words in front of your kids? And then you wonder why they use curse words. Do you know what a curse word is? I don't know if you know what a curse word is. A curse word is a word that communicates to anybody that hears it that you're not pleased with the situation that God preordained for you, right? It's God who wills to do in you as he pleases for his good pleasure. Therefore, every trial and circumstance is ordained by God to squeeze out of you what still needs to go. So any negative word 
to that situation communicates that you're not pleased with the way God is running your life. That's the truth. And it's not really the curse word, so to speak. We can name curse words. But it's any word that, re- that, that tells anyone who's watching or hearing that you're unhappy with this situation. Don't we have the camouflage curse words? Camouflaged. Oh, shoot. Oh, I know what you were trying to say. Oh, dang. Oh, I know what you were trying to say. Yeah, we have the camouflage curse words. It's an attitude. It's not a word. It's an attitude of the heart. It's God who wills to do in you as he pleases for his good pleasure. So stop complaining in front of people or they're going to think that you're not a gentle, loving, calm, trusting Christian. They're going to think you're like everybody else. That you may become blameless, harmless children of God without fault, in the, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, Paul does kind of lean to us in chap, uh, chapter 1. We, we, in chapter 2, we saw, like, you know, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You know, do nothing through selfish ambition or, com- com- or conceit, but in lowliness of mind or humble mind. Let each of you esteem others better than himself. And let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. He kind of tells us that we should, Jesus should, is our example. We should act like Jesus. Good luck. See, Jesus was perfect. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. We're going to fail, and we're going to have tough times, and we're going to make mistakes. But I know that every single time I've ever made a mistake with my, my son or my friends or my wife or, my, or anyone, my boss or anyone, I've always followed the Holy Spirit's leading by saying, you need to go and ask them to forgive you. Ask them to forgive you. Why? Because you just blew your... Christian testimony. And they might be the ones looking to you for hope in Christ, and now they're not going to look for the hope in Christ because you're a fraud. So there should be the Holy Spirit that moves us and prompts us to have that godly character. Verse 16 says, holding fast the word of life. That's what the word of God is. Brings life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God brings life. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have, not, that I have run, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. He's telling them, stay the course because you're my hope. You're my joy. I don't want to believe that all my thri- striving and all my my mission work and all my teaching and all the love I poured out into you guys was in vain. And that's the heart of every pastor, I believe, or every Sunday school teacher or every children's church teacher is that their work isn't in vain, that they're really making true investments. And that investment is really bringing fruit into the lives of others. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. And if I am being poured out as a drink offering. Paul, Paul has suffered, by the way. Here he is in prison writing this letter He's already been in prison, they say, possibly six, seven times. He's been beaten. He's got, he's got scars on his back from being beaten. He's suffered miserably. He's been sick. He's been hungry. He has really, he's been cold. He's had a tough time. He has suffered for the sake of Christ. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith... 
Now, a drink offering in, in, in the temple was when you had the, the altar, and the altar was so hot and it was burning for the sacrifice. Uh, they would take the, the drink offering, you'd throw it on the altar, and it would dissipate immediately. It would just go, and it'd be gone. And you see, and I'm being poured out as a drink offering um, because of what you guys are doing. It's bringing me that joy and that comfort and that assurance that my suffering is not in vain. It's a good thing. And how blessed is it for those who are watching your testimony, watching your walk, watching the way you talk and react to things. What a blessing it is for them. And so your suffering is not in vain. Although it seems at times where your, your life is but a vapor, like psh, it's worth it because people are watching Christians. I told you that, um, that one, one out of a hundred people read the Bible. One out of a hundred people read the Bible. Ninety-nine out of a hundred people read the one reading the Bible. One out of 100 people read the Bible. 99 out of 100 people read the one reading the Bible. So you don't take your walk as a Christian lightly. As soon as you open your mouth and say, well, I'm a Christian, they're watching you. Okay, let's see what a Christian is like. Let's see what a Christian is like. Let's see how they act, how they talk. There's something wrong when you can't tell the difference between an unsafe person and a safe person. There's something wrong. Someone said, I love hanging out at the bars and drinking with all my buddies because, you know, if I hang out with them, I'm going to be able to get them to be saved. Really? <laughs> and what book are you reading? That's in 2 Bolognians chapter 4. <laughs> yeah, I tell my friends all about Jesus and we pass the bobo around. <sighs> yeah, and what book are you reading? Chapter 7 of Bolognians. Holding fast the word of life. I love that. Verse 18. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Because there are Philippians that are being poured out like a drink offering as well because of the testimony of Christ. There are those who are staying the course, running the race, being true to the word. They're living it out as Paul is living it out because he's gotten word back that they're doing good. And he's saying, hey, for this reason, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Verse 19, for I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Now, Timothy is someone who Paul loves dearly. He's a young man that has been groomed by Paul. He's an upcoming leader, a young pastor. Uh, and Paul, he stays with Paul. He helps Paul. He's Paul's servant. And he says, I'm going to send Paul. I'm going to send Timothy to you. I'm going to send Timothy. Uh, he's going to check you guys out. And he's going to come out and let, tell me how, how it's going. And he's my buddy. He says, verse 20, he says, I have no one like-minded who would sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. All, they all seek their own. Wow. How many of you can seriously, honestly say that my life is Christ? My life is Christ. To live is Christ, to die is gain. All I want to do is live for Jesus. That's what I want. 
I want to live for Jesus day and night. I just want to serve the Lord. I want to be a witness. I want to be a testimony. I want my life to shine for Christ. The Bible says to let your light shine before all men that they might see your good works, which is Christ who works in you, and you work it out of you. For all the world to see your light shining, that they might glorify your Father in heaven. Well, I tell you, it says, for, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. You can't make someone make Christ their life. That's impossible. It's impossible. The only way a person makes Christ their life is this, this awe of who he is in your life and what he's done for you, and then this submissive surrender. And in that, something spiritual takes place, and there's a passion. There is a yearning to do his will. It's just all you think about. You lay in bed and you think of, whoa, I could do this, I could do this, and Lord, uh, I'm looking forward to this, and Lord, I'm looking forward to that. And you're going to have ups and downs, and you're going to have failures, and you're going to have complaints, and you're going to have bad days. But the, the true purpose and motivation of your life is to follow Christ. Like I said, Christ is our example. That's a high standard. A high standard. He's our example. Do you know Jesus never carried a weapon? Never carried a weapon. Not once. He didn't carry a weapon. But yet he won the greatest victory of mankind. But he never carried a weapon. He was hated, but chose to love. He was incredible. He weeped for us. He wept for us. An amazing example. He worked tirelessly for the, Lord, for the Father's will. Tirelessly. And he walked everywhere he went. No one gave him a car. Not one person offered him their car. He walked everywhere. There's no record of him having a, a, a camel. He used a donkey once just to go down a hill. If it was winter, I would have gave him a sled. For all seek their own, not the things of Christ. Verse 22 says, For you know his proven character, that as a son, Timothy, with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it's going how it goes with me, because he's in prison waiting for trial. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly, which he never did. He never got out of prison. But at the time of this writing, he believed that he was going to be out and going to see them. But yet I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my needs. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed be because you had heard that he was sick, and he was sick, indeed, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him. And it follows out. You could read the rest around that time. But wow, is this is a challenge. Is this not a challenge? It's a challenge. God has put a challenge out there for us today. He really has. He's given us a challenge. I'm so glad that God is patient, though, isn't he? He's been patient with you and me. Praise the Lord. He's, he's a good, good Lord. 
He's a good God. And our Heavenly Father is so merciful. It says his mercy is anew every day. That's why you're still there. He's working with us. He's working with you. You're not a basket case. You're not a basket case. You're really not. You're his beautiful creation, and you're a work in process, in progress. He's working with you as he pleases for his good pleasure. Amen? All right, let's see if my guitar works. We'll close with one song.